from the authors of Author Masterminds. This is Mysterious. Mystery surrounds us every day. Join us and listen to true stories of mystery, from human behavior to nature and the physical environment to paranormal experiences. The stories are true, even if we can't explain them. On Friday night, December 6, 1991, a heinous crime was committed in the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop in Austin, Texas, located in a small strip mall near the much larger North Cross Mall. Hi, I'm Victoria Hardesty, author of Action and Adventure with Arabian Horses. I'll be hosting this episode of the mysterious podcast, The Yogurt Shop Murders. Author Masterminds and the Readers and Writers Book Club sponsor this podcast. Welcome aboard! Eliza Thomas and Jennifer Harbison, two 17-year-old girls, reported for their shifts at the yogurt shop after school. They were scheduled to work until closing at 11 p.m. that night. They closed the shop many times before and knew the routine. Cleaning tables, stacking chairs on tables, refilling napkin dispensers, cleaning the kitchen in the back, etc. Jennifer's younger sister, 15-year-old Sarah Harbison, and her best friend, 13-year-old Amy Ayers, initially went to the North Cross Mall for a few hours before taking the short walk to the yogurt shop to catch a ride home with Jennifer that evening for a sleepover. Eliza was a senior in high school, working at the yogurt shop for extra money to fund her car. She loved reading and dancing, and was highly involved in the high school's Future Farmers of America, FFA chapter. Her mother believed she would go on to become a writer someday. Eliza's best friend, Jennifer Harbison, was also a senior in high school. She was an avid athlete, the manager of the school's drill team, and a member of the track team. She was also a member of the school's FFA program. Eliza got the yogurt shop job first and told Jennifer when there was an opening. Jennifer needed the money to support her car as well. Sarah Harbison was a member of the junior varsity cheerleading squad and a member of FFA. She raised lambs to show at the Travis County Fair and Rodeo. Amy Avery was the only middle school girl in the bunch, but she was best friends with Sarah Harbison. She was active in the same chapter of FFA as the other girls. Amy was on her school's yearbook staff. She was creative and won awards at the local county fair for her needlepoint work. All four girls were animal lovers to the extent that Eliza and Amy wanted to become veterinarians someday. The last sale rung up on the register that night at 10.46 p.m. for a couple who just left the movie theater and wanted a dessert before going home. They saw two men in the shop that looked out of place. According to witnesses, one came in earlier wearing a green jacket. He stalled at the counter, allowing other customers in front of him to place their orders for a while. A mall security officer parked his security car in front of the shop and walked in, observing the young man letting people in line ahead of him. The young man asked him if he was a policeman. The security officer nodded and refused to go ahead of the young man. The young man ordered a Coke in a can, went around the counter, and disappeared into the back room. The security officer asked Eliza where was he going. She told him she allowed him in the back to use the restroom. The man waited around with his yogurt for several minutes, but never saw the young man return to the front of the shop before leaving. Another young man came in, ordered a Coke in a can, and sat with the first young man at a table near the counter. Customers who observed the two thought they looked out of place. They whispered, leaning over the table so no one else could hear their conversation. No one got a good look at the pair because of the heavy jackets and collars up that obscured their view of them. The last customers left the yogurt shop at about 10.48 p.m., leaving the four girls and the two strange young men. 
There were no witnesses to what happened next. The front door to the shop was locked and the front lights turned off. Police assumed the two men robbed the store at gunpoint and herded the four girls into the back room. They forced the girls to take their clothes off and tied them up and gagged them with their own clothing. At least one of them was raped. They shot all four girls in the back of their head, execution style, with a 22 caliber pistol and a 380 semi-automatic handgun. Amy was shot twice. The first bullet missed her brain. The second shot was through the right side of her head. The perpetrators stacked the bodies in a pile, used cardboard, paper cups, napkins, and anything they could find flammable, poured lighter fluid or gasoline over the pile, and lit it on fire to cover evidence of their crime before they left through the back door, leaving the door wide open. The fire burned hot enough to melt the top rungs on a heavy aluminum ladder propped against the back wall. The bodies of the girls were obscured in the debris. An Austin rookie patrolman, Troy Gay, saw the smoke coming from the back of the shop and called the fire department. They arrived in a hurry to extinguish the flames in the shop and protect the shops next to it. They came in with hoses full on and police back up. After the fire was knocked down, fireman Dave DeVoe saw something in the debris pile and asked, Oh, is that a foot? The other firemen dug through the debris and discovered the four bodies. They notified the police. Hi, I thought I'd take a short break and tell you about one of my books. Prince Ali, Wonder Horse Book One, was our first book. Nancy and I worked with an editor who misunderstood the book to be a crime drama. So we ripped off the first 19 chapters to begin with the crime that takes place in the story. After more experience and three more books in the series, I rewrote the first one. Prince Ali had everything, talent, charisma, and a devoted best friend, Becky Howard. He won every time he set a hoof in the show ring. He garnered more fans from personal and TV appearances. Becky was with him every step of the way even riding him in the Swallows Day Parade in their hometown, San Juan Capistrano. Disaster struck when two thugs put Becky in a coma, drugged him, and dragged Prince Ali off to sell for a diabolical purpose. When their buyer realized who Wally was, he nixed the deal. That landed the pampered show horse high in the mountains in late March. One night, a week later, he discovered the corral gate unlatched. Prince Ali mustered every ounce of strength, courage, and stamina he had to walk into the wilderness searching for the best friend he couldn't live without. Prince Ali and my other Wonder Horse books are available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online bookshops. You'll find links to my books in the show notes. John Jones Jr. was the only homicide detective on duty that night, so he got the call. At the time, he also had a local news crew following him around, filming for a program about homicide in Texas for their local TV station. He made them wait outside in the parking lot until he'd taken a look at the scene himself. Their cameras continued rolling and showed a chaotic scene of public safety officials tramping in and out of what they would soon learn was the scene of a quadruple murder. The first report from the fire department was that one body was found. Before Jones arrived, they changed that to four bodies. It appeared Amy was not dead when the fire was set. She managed to crawl off the pile of bodies and a few feet beyond before she died. Her body was burned over 60%. Amy also had a sock tied around her neck looking like someone tried to strangle her. None of the girls were recognizable. Jones was able to identify the girls from cars left in the parking lot, checking in with the owners of the shop, and contacting the parents of the girls whose cars were left behind. Jennifer and Sarah's mom wasn't really upset when they weren't home right after closing the store. Both girls raised animals for the Travis County Fair and they typically spent time 
every morning and every evening with their animals. It would not be unusual for them to spend a couple of hours with their animals in the evening. They kept their animals in a barn between the yogurt shop and their home. The yogurt shop murders rocked Austin to the core. Four beautiful young girls were murdered for a few hundred dollars in the till. A private group of entrepreneurs offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the murderers. The coroner's office completed their autopsies on the girls and included vaginal swabs in case the murderers left DNA behind. They had very little to go on. Because of the fire and resulting water damage from the fire department, washed or burned away any other evidence they may have found for the investigators. They did recover the bullets used to kill the girls, so they knew what weapons came into play. A few days after the murders, 16-year-old Maurice Pierce was in the North Cross Mall with a 22 caliber pistol in his pocket. He was arrested and hauled in for questioning by the police. The gun was the same caliber as one used in the recent murders. Maurice was interrogated over and over and over and finally confessed to the murders. The investigators involved cut him loose because his confession wasn't credible. He didn't have the facts right and he couldn't answer the questions they were asking him. He did mention three other friends during the interview, Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, Maurice Pierce, and Forrest Welburn became the prime suspects in the case. They were all teenagers at the time, between 16 and 18 years old. The police interviewed more than 1,200 potential suspects over the next few years. Most didn't fit or had an alibi for the time. Two men wanted for questioning were in Mexico. Austin investigators contacted Mexican authorities who questioned the two men before sending them off to prison. They both died in prison in Mexico on local charges. Others who told people they were involved in the murders were found to be in jail at the time and couldn't possibly have committed the crime or were not in the area at the time or didn't have the correct answers to the questions police asked. Springsteen, Scott, Pierce, and Welburn remained their top suspects. They were questioned numerous times. Sadly, their questioning lasted hours at a time, and several resulted in outrageous behavior by the investigators. One pulled a handgun and held it to a young man's temple. At other times, the boys ended up sleep-deprived, as teams of interrogators kept at them for hours on end. The police finally arrested Springsteen and Scott for the murders. They had admitted, they had admitted their involvement in the case under duress during these interrogations. Each pointed the finger at the other one for the murders. They dropped the cases against Pierce and Walburn for lack of evidence. In 1999, Springsteen and Scott went to trial. They were convicted and sentenced. Springsteen got the death penalty, while Scott got life in prison. Springsteen and Scott's defense teams argued for years to be heard by the Texas Court of Appeals for defects in the original trials. Our law says if someone accuses you of a crime, you have the right to confront them. In court, cross-examination is done by the defense attorney for anyone who accuses their client of committing a crime. Springsteen and Scott claimed the other man committed the crime in this case. Both were in jail at the time. Each man had a separate trial, so they were not in the courtroom simultaneously. The defense argued that since each man accused the other, and convictions were the result, the fact that neither was allowed to cross-examine the other violated their rights and the law. The Court of Appeals agreed and overthrew their convictions. The court released both men on bond in 2009. Prosecutors fully intended to put the men back on trial. They learned about a new DNA test that could prove their case and ordered it. It is a Y-STR and it searches for male DNA only. The vaginal swabs of the girls were put through that test. No one knew what the new test results would reveal. As a result of the new test, a partial male DNA profile was obtained from one of the victims. To the surprise of the prosecutor's office, the DNA sample didn't match any of the four young men suspected of the crime. Springsteen and Scott were released 
after spending 10 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. All four cases were closed based on that evidence. Attorney Amber Barelli played a role in Scott and Springsteen's defense teams. She was adamant the police had it all wrong when they arrested the four young men. She believes to this day they should have fixated on the two unidentified customers from the yogurt shop. During the investigation, 52 customers who came into the yogurt shop that day were questioned by the police investigators. Some were even put under hypnosis to gather information on the two strange men in the shop that night. No one could give them a precise enough description of the two men. The only evidence that that was suggested was that they drove a green car that night. Over the years, dozens confessed to the quadruple homicide, but were released. Their stories of guilt, just that, stories. Rife with false confessions and lacking in DNA matches, the case of the so-called yogurt shop murders has left all but suspects, more than 1,200 of them, and included the arrest of four boys, twice, years apart. This case has yet to be solved. Hi, Victoria again. I just wanted to thank you for listening today. You can find links to the Author Masterminds, the Readers and Writers Book Club, and my books in the show notes. We'll be back soon for another episode of Mysterious. See you then. Bye.